I'm Nima Rajan. Just a handful of votes make the difference between victory and defeat in a number of ridings across the country. With the mail-in ballot count continuing in three tightly contested ridings, election experts warn recounts will likely have to settle who ultimately sits in parliament. The Liberals currently have 159 seats, although one was claimed by a candidate who will sit on as an independent MP. The Conservatives have 119 seats, the Bloc Québécois 33, the NDP are at 25, and the Greens at 2. Federal Conservatives appear split on whether Erin O'Toole should remain as leader of the party. A member of the party's National Council is petitioning for members to be able to review Mr. O'Toole's leadership earlier than scheduled in 2023. But re-elected Alberta MP Garnet Janis tweeted yesterday that Conservatives should avoid, quote, another round of internal conflict or public navel-gazing after the unsuccessful campaign. Mr. O'Toole says he is committed to stay on as leader. Well, now that the election is over, Canada's first ministers are urging Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to now focus on long-term predictable funding for health care. Premiers from all the provinces and territories held a post-election meeting by phone yesterday to discuss their need for more money. The federal government provides 22 percent of funding through the Canada Health Transfer based on the size of a population. But the council is calling for that to be upped to 35 percent. The federal government says it will provide critical care medical staff and help from the military to Alberta as the province's hospitals face an overwhelming wave of COVID-19 patients. Bill Blair, the federal minister of public safety and emergency preparedness, says the armed forces will help airlift patients to other provinces. An analyst and director of Wood Mackenzie's Canadian gas research team is warning consumers to brace for rising natural gas bills this winter. Natural gas prices in Canada and the U.S. have not hit the record levels being seen right now in Europe and the U.K. However, they are still higher than they've been in more than six years. Increased economic activity, the loosening of COVID-19 restrictions around the globe, and the phase-out of coal are all helping to drive increased demand for natural gas, but production hasn't caught up. The Insurance Bureau of Canada says it is expecting more than 800 claims related to this summer's White Rock Lake wildfire in BC. One of the most destructive blazes in the province this year eventually covered more than 833 square kilometers and destroyed 78 properties in central Okanagan. The Bureau says the fire is estimated to have caused $77 million in insurance damage. The RCMP has charged two former SNC-Lavalin executives and the engineering company itself for allegedly paying bribes to obtain a Montreal bridge repair contract. The charges include forgery, conspiracy to commit forgery, fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, fraud against the government, and conspiracy to commit fraud against the government. Lavalin was previously charged with bribery and fraud in relation to its past work in Libya. Police say two children found dead Wednesday in a Gatineau, Quebec home were killed by their father before he took his own life. Gatineau police confirmed the two girls, aged three and five, were killed by their 51-year-old father. Officers discovered the three bodies while making a wellness check. The leader of the People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier, is in a bit of social media trouble. In a tweet on Wednesday, Mr. Bernier called three journalists, quote, idiots. He posted their emails, encouraging his 160,000 followers to contact the reporters. The reporters from CTV News, Global News and The Hill Times had asked about the PPC's endorsement from white nationalist groups. Twitter ordered Mr. Bernier to remove the tweet, and it has since been taken down. A former Nazi death squad member has died at the age of 97 while still fighting deportation from Canada. Helmut Oberlander's family says he died peacefully while surrounded by loved ones. The federal government stripped Mr. Oberlander of his citizenship several times, but he repeatedly fought the move. His latest hearing began this month on whether he could remain in Canada or be returned to Germany. Jewish rights organizations are expressing frustration that his legal saga never reached completion. Canada's ambassador to the United Nations says it's in Canada's national interest to do more to ensure the rest of the world is vaccinated against COVID-19. Bob Ray notes the rise of new variants and the fact that the country's economy is dependent on international trade should spur Canada to share more of its COVID-19 vaccine surplus with less fortunate countries. 
All right, up next, we take a deeper look at rising natural gas prices around the world and the role that Canada can play in this issue. We'll have an interview with a development strategist and researcher coming up next. That and, of course, more news from around the world only on Forum Daily News. So stay tuned. We'll be back after a short break. Many Canadians can expect to pay more to heat their homes this winter. Increased global demand, tight supplies and the phasing out of coal have led to increased use for natural gas. Gas distributors like Fortis BC, Enbridge Gas and Manitoba Hydro have already advised their customers of rate hikes. Residential customers in parts of the country will see their monthly bills go up by about 9%. And analysts say prices will remain elevated at least into the spring. Canadians are not alone, though. Natural gas prices have also hit record levels around Europe. To talk us through the situation and what it means for Canada is Dr. Heather exener piro She is a strategist and researcher with pro-development Indigenous groups in Western Canada. Doctor, welcome to Forum Daily. Thanks for having me. So what is behind this spike in natural gas prices worldwide? I mean, it's it's complicated and there's a lot of issues, but there's some th- fundamental problems. One is that gas prices have been low for years, so there hasn't been a lot of investment in more production. So we're still using gas, but we don't have more gas to use. And I think carbon policies and COVID exacerbated that trend. Uh, so it, it just has not been an attractive sector for investors. What's happening in Europe this week is kind of a perfect storm of, of those things. Some nuclear have been coming offline. Uh, so there's demand for other kinds of energy. Uh, Asia is is needing uh, you know more supply. There's a COVID recovery, so people are you know there's a post pandemic kind of a surge in demand, uh, and they also you know there's a fire at an interconnector. <laughs> Sorry, there's a, a lot of small things. Wind was down this week, so a lot of things made it a very critical problem in in the UK this week and in Europe. But the bigger problem is long term. That before we hit winter, there isn't enough natural gas right now to meet demand, and countries and energy energy suppliers are seeing that, and that's why there's this you know market demand and, and it's price crunch because people are trying to secure their supplies ahead of winter, and there just isn't enough gas in the market to do that. A lot of uh, roadblocks in this market, ma'am. I want to jump to an article in iPolitics that you wrote. Uh, you said energy security is essential in the developed world. So can you mm-hmm. expand on that and what that would look like for Canada? Well, I think we become very complacent with our energy policies. We've been focusing on climate policy, and obviously, you know, climate crisis is real, and we need to do things. But we're eliminating sources of fossil fuels before we're replacing them with anything else. And so, inevitably, and this is predictable, we're seeing that now that we don't have enough energy to meet all of our energy demands, uh, and we're starting to feel the crunch. Canada is a lot luckier than many because we do have so much energy in our country, not only fossil fuels, but uh, hydro uh, and and nuclear and many other things. But we're going to start to see it in other countries first. And places like Asia, where they're largely net importers of energy, uh, are going to be scrambling to find the sources in the world market that right now are not coming. And we're still not seeing the investment post-COVID in the oil and gas sector that we were seeing beforehand, partly because of climate policies uh, and, and partly because of other things. And considering Canada's richness in resources, uh, you say in your article that we're actually heading towards a 1970s style energy crisis. So that's a big statement, ma'am. Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, in the 1970s, what we saw was, and this was almost, you know, um, a political, it was a political, it wasn't a demand problem, it was a political demand problem, is that OPEC decided to put an embargo on oil uh, imports and exports to the United States and others because of uh, the Israeli war. So that was, you know, there were, there was supplies at that time and they just wouldn't export them. This is a different case where we aren't really producing enough gas and even enough oil. If you look at what we're producing, even where there's excess uh, capacity, um, it's not going to meet demand. And unfortunately, you know, I think we all wanted demand to go down. But like I said, we haven't replaced the fossil fuel energy infrastructure to, with anything else. And so demand is still going to go up probably for at least another decade. And we just don't have the supply in the pipeline basically to match that. Um, so what happened in the energy crisis? You know, global GDP fell by 4%. That's a COVID level economic depression uh, that we're seeing. And, and now the problem is, you know, we're kind of self-imposing on ourselves by not putting investment into energy where we need it. All right, ma'am, just about a minute left here, but we're also seeing roadblocks to development uh, affecting the construction of these projects, of pipeline projects in Canada. Uh, So could those same issues affect other kinds of resource development in the country? Yeah, so 
So I know for a lot of people, they want to see less fossil fuel investment. Unfortunately, we still need fossil fuels, so that may not be wise in the long term. But if we want to replace, and we do, if we want to pre replace fossil fuel infrastructure, then we need more hydro, we need more transmission lines, we need more nuclear, we need all these extra sources of energy. Right now, our regulatory policies, our investment policies are not going to allow for that fast transition from our fossil fuel infrastructure the way things are today. If we do want to move quickly on the climate crisis, then we have to start developing at a massive pace on our mining and our hydro and our nuclear and everything else. All right, Doctor, we truly appreciate your time today on Forum Daily. Thank you again for your time today. Thanks for having me. Stay tuned, everyone. Up next, we take a look at stories happening across Canada. BC's government looks to allocate more funding to buy more naloxone kits. Saskatchewan suspends its organ donation program. And Quebec's premier is offering bonuses to address the nursing shortage. These stories and more coming up next. BC Premier John Horgan says his government is working to allocate funding to buy more naloxone kits. This as some police agencies have to buy their own supplies of the overdose-reversing drug amid a depleted provincial supply. More than 7,700 people have died from suspected overdoses since 2016. This is when BC declared a public health emergency due to rising deaths linked to the powerful opioid fentanyl. Alberta Health Services says it is pausing mental illness and addiction program referrals in the province. It says it needs to reassign staff to help deal with the strain on the health care system caused by COVID-19. AHS says some inpatients will be transferred to non-acute spaces. It says a unit that provides recovery support programming for people with stabilized mental illness will help patients with an online program. Saskatchewan has suspended its organ donation program due to a lack of resources brought on by the province's fourth wave of COVID-19. The Saskatchewan Health Authority says that means if residents who are registered donors die, their organs will not be given to people who need them. Healthcare in Saskatchewan is being restructured to redeploy staff and other resources to help with record COVID-19 hospitalizations that are mostly fueled by the unvaccinated. A Saskatoon judge has ruled in favor of allowing a father to have his child vaccinated for COVID despite the child's mother being opposed. Justice Michael McGaw says he made the decision in the best interest of their 12-year-old daughter who has diabetes. Court documents show the father was concerned that she was more at risk of contracting COVID-19 because of her diabetic condition. The mother opposed vaccinating the child because she said her daughter did not want the jab. Manitoba Premier Calvin Gertzen says he and his family have been threatened over the province's COVID-19 public health orders. Mr. Gertzen, the member of the legislature for Steinbach, says he continues to support current public health orders, including vaccine mandates and proof of vaccination protocols. Mr. Gertzen says he doesn't like the measures, but having a proof of vaccination policy is better than having to cancel 15,000 surgeries. A demonstration outside Ontario's legislature this afternoon was one of several planned across the country. The youth-led organization Fridays for Future Toronto organized the rally and march. Members say the event provides an opportunity to call on the new federal government to demand action on climate change promises. Protesters also want climate justice to be added to the Ontario education curriculum for all grades to end the encampment evictions in Toronto and full implementation of calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Human or the Ontario Human Rights Commission is seeking public input on derogatory street and building names. The commission is looking to deal with what it calls a quickly evolving issue that has increasingly seen Indigenous and racialized communities call for the removal of statues of historic figures. They want those perceived as colonizers, slave owners, or advancers of racist policies removed. They are also growing calls for officials to rename roads, buildings, and other institutions named after historical figures for those same reasons. Quebec Premier François Legault says he is launching a mini-revolution in the health network to address a shortage of nurses in the province. Mr. Legault says full-time nurses in the public system will receive one-time bonuses of $15,000. Nurses who have quit the public health care network and want to return full-time will get $12,000. The bonus will be $18,000 for full-time nurses who are working in five regions that are hit particularly hard by shortages, including Outaouais and Gaspé. 
Certain New Brunswick residents with compromised immune systems will now be eligible for a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Provincial Chief Medical Officer Dr. Jennifer Russell says the additional dose could provide better protection for those with a reduced immune system response to the vaccine. This includes organ transplant recipients, people receiving chemo, those with HIV infection or AIDS, and people born with immune system dysfunction. Police in Prince Edward Island can now issue emergency alerts directly to Islanders' mobile devices. The government says the RCMP and all municipal police forces will be able to issue alerts through radio and televisions as well as mobile devices. The National Alert Ready system delivers emergency information to TV, radio and compatible wireless devices when lives and property are in danger. New Brunswick's apple growers say this summer's wet weather has been good for business. Farmers say the season started about a week to 10 days earlier this year. The earlier season allowed for more growing time and a faster harvest. All right, after the break, we take a look at news from around the world. The CDC approves COVID-19 vaccine booster shots for some people. The UK is facing a truck driver shortage. And the sister of North Korea's leader is calling for talks to resume with the South. These stories and more news from around the world coming up after the break. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is endorsing COVID-19 vaccine booster shots for people 65 and older, nursing home residents, and those aged 50 to 64 who have risky underlying health problems. The agency is also recommending healthcare workers or those whose job puts them at increased risk of being exposed to the virus get the shot as well. The extra dose would be given once patients are at least six months past their Pfizer shot. The inequity of COVID-19 vaccine distribution came into sharp focus on Thursday. This as many African countries spoke at the UN's annual meeting of world leaders. Already, the struggle to contain the coronavirus pandemic has featured prominently in leaders' speeches this week. Several African leaders urged UN member states on Thursday to support a proposal to temporarily waive certain intellectual property rights to allow more countries to produce COVID-19 vaccines. China's central bank has declared all transactions involving Bitcoin and other virtual currencies illegal. Chinese banks were banned from handling cryptocurrencies in 2013, but the government issued a reminder this year. The central bank complained Bitcoin, Ethereum and other digital currencies disrupt the financial system and are used in money laundering and other crime. The People's Bank of China is developing an electronic version of the country's yuan for cashless transactions that can be tracked and controlled by Beijing. Germany's political parties are gearing up ahead of the national election on Sunday. It will determine who succeeds Chancellor Angela Merkel after 16 years in power. Ms. Merkel's center-right union bloc has made small gains in the polls in recent weeks, but it remains narrowly behind the center-left Social Democrats. The Greens are trailing in third place but could play kingmakers when it comes to forming a governing coalition. Britain doesn't have enough truck drivers. The shortage is contributing to scarcity of everything, from McDonald's milkshakes to supermarket produce. Now energy firms are rationing supplies of gasoline and closing some petrol pumps. The driver drought means wages are rising, and people laid off from other sectors are starting to retrain as truckers. But the head of a food industry group warns that the problems won't be easily solved. He says occasionally empty shelves are going to be the new normal. Parts shortages are hitting Europe's biggest economy, Germany. Trouble getting the key components helped send the closely watched IFO index lower for September. That is the third drop in a row. The index surveys companies about their outlook. It is regarded as a sign of where the economy is headed. The institute says that the manufacturers are facing a bottleneck recession as they can't get the computer chips they need to fill orders. Other materials are in short supply as well. Some Chinese banks are disclosing what they are owed by a real estate developer that is struggling under $310 billion in debt. This is in an effort to ease concerns of financial turmoil in China's economy or the global financial markets. The lenders say they can cope with a potential default by Evergrande Group. Economists say Beijing can prevent a credit crunch in China, but wants to avoid bailing out Evergrande because it's trying to force companies to reduce debt levels. 
Paraguay's crucial outlet to the sea has fallen to its lowest level since at least 1904, and that threatens massive economic losses to the small South American nation. Government figures Thursday show the Paraguay River at 56 centimeters below reference in the capital. This is about two centimeters below last year's previous record. The 1,615-mile river is a crucial commercial gateway to the Atlantic for an otherwise landlocked nation. The influential sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un says her country is willing to resume talks with South Korea if conditions are met. This indicates it wants Seoul to persuade Washington to relax crippling economic sanctions. Kim Yo-jong's statement came days after North Korea conducted missile tests. Experts say the tests are intended to show it will keep expanding its weapons arsenal if the sanctions stay in place. Nigerian police say they have arrested three key suspects over the abduction for ransom of 121 students from a school in northern Kaduna State. Assailants had stormed the Bethel Baptist High School on July 5th, seizing the students from their hostels. All but 21 of them have been released. Africa's most populous country has witnessed at least 10 mass school abductions in the last year. Over 1,400 students were taken in total, often in remote areas where there is little security presence. Fossilized footprints discovered in New Mexico indicate early humans were walking across North America 23,000 years ago. The footprints are said to provide a more solid baseline for when humans definitely were in North America. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for news on demand, you could always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and be sure to visit our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We'll see you next time, Canada. Take care, everyone.